My name is Brian Wish. I'm an entrepreneur, CEO, and Pathfinder. If I've learned anything in life, it's that self-discovery is a critical part of living intentionally, building meaningful relationships, and achieving the future we see for ourselves. In July of 2021, I sold all my possessions, headed west, and began a quest to live a fuller and more meaningful life. The experience helped me truly understand the power of a single moment. And through my conversations with leaders from all walks of life, I've seen how that one phone call, heartbreak, diagnosis, or lost job can transform the entire course of our lives. In this podcast, I sit down with entrepreneurs, influencers, and experts across industries to talk through the events that changed everything. Together, we'll relive the make or break decisions, hard conversations, periods of despair and hope, chance encounters, and everything that followed. Lolette Davitan is the CFO and Executive Vice President of Phonexa, a web and call lead tracking and distribution software specializing in finance, health, home services, and insurance verticals. Lolette oversees the company's business development, supervises on questions of compliance and internal finances, and maintains relationships with key clients. She works closely with company leadership on long-term strategy execution while also overseeing all financial aspects of the company and acting as a liaison between the firm and their outside legal counsel. Lillette has over eight years of experience in business and tax planning, has collaborated with numerous Fortune 500 companies in their career, and has extensive familiarity within the financial industry. Her experience has also exposed her to various regulatory environments where she has had to help provide internal and external guidance to maintain compliance with government agencies. Her wealth of business knowledge allows her to provide critical oversight to every department and maintain a welcoming open-door policy to all personnel. She is known for being dynamic in her talent and always lending an extra hand when needed. From business development and compliance to human resources and talent acquisition, Lilith has served many roles and maintains her steadfast commitment to leadership throughout. Welcome to the One Away Show. It's good to be part of the show, Brian. Thank you. It's great to have you here. I want to ask you, what is the One Away moment that you want to share with us today? I mean, I can think of a few moments, but the one that always sticks out, it's the one that I love talking about because it was such a sensitive time in my career. I'll just never forget it. It's like, it's kind of how my career started. So, you know, by profession, as you may know, I'm a CPA. So I did everything the way I'm supposed to. I went to school and I went to uh, a big four accounting firm and all of this great experience. I knew pretty early on it wasn't for me. I happened to meet uh, David Gasparian, who is the owner of the company I'm CEO for currently. And I met him when I was 25. And that's when I was kind of evaluating, okay, I've got this going on. What should I do? Uh, And I found out that he has a, a digital marketing company and that eventually turned into also a software company. I had no experience in it. And I met him a few times. My initial thought was, let me just help him out here and there and see if I like it. I was like, okay, if I do that, I also know myself. I'm probably going to do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Overnight, I was like, I'm going to take a leap of faith and I'm going to change my entire career. I I kind of dropped everything and um, talked to my relationships at the company I was at. Everybody gave me their blessing. I went into a pre-revenue startup to start and develop a finance team. And so, yes, initially was supposed to be an extension of what I was already good at, which is accounting and, and being a CPA. You know, within a couple of months, I was given a developer and, and we sat down and we automated the entire finance process and I moved over to strategy and technology. From then on, I mean, it was incredible. I don't really know anything in the industry. I don't have any experience in it. If my mm-hmm. job experience dates back two years prior to that, I'm potentially throwing away a really prestigious license to uh, help run a software company. I never even had the intention of actually growing into a CEO role. I, that confidence that I had in myself would probably be my one away moment. It was mm. like, if this doesn't work out. I know that I'm confident enough that I can either come back to what I'm comfortable with or try something else. But it was also a very sensitive financial time for me. And so had it not worked out, it would have been hard. But if it was hard, it would have been manageable. So I'm kind of proud of myself for making a decision like that early on. But not to say I would recommend people to just go jump ship at the age of 25. It worked out for me. So I'm lucky. Yeah. Well, sometimes some self-belief and perseverance can go a long way. Now, I want to ask you, you know, you talked about going to a big four accounting firm 
and thinking more of a traditional or safer route, you know, you described it out of, you know, out of school. What was the interest there early on? Was there an intention behind that? Was it just, hey, that's what your parents said you should do? Or was there <laughs> curious what led you in that direction out of the gate? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. And I have a few ways to answer that question. But the you know, parents part is definitely in there. You know, I'm, I'm Armenian and growing up and going to school, we have to be doctors, lawyers or accountants, more doctors and lawyers and accountants. But still, like I was always a jack of all trades kind of a person. I loved all my classes and I was excelling in all of them. And I worked while I went to school the entire time. So I also knew my time management. And because of that, I had the hardest time deciding what to do. Initially, I wanted to do psychology because I like interacting with people. It was pretty apparent, like I wanted to do a little bit of everything and that's not a way to have a career. So through some conversations with my teachers and parents and my husband at the time, boyfriend, we were talking about what I would actually be really good at. And the entire consensus, I think everybody else more than me, is I'm really great at math. So it was always, you know, strategy and and logic and how to apply numbers into that. You know, with math, there's, very few things you can do. There's a lot of things you can do in terms of, you know, if you want to go into physics or or even chemistry or accounting or mathematics, but what do you want to actually apply the math to? And my thing was, well, I love business and business has to have accounting. It's one of the core values of a business and core operating functions of it. And I was thinking if I'm ever going to get into business, I might as well start with a field that I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with. I took all my classes. I hated every single accounting class I ever took. Uh, It was just very mundane and boring and very structured. It didn't give the creative aspect that I was looking for. But I also knew that's not exactly how business works. And I was hoping that I could eventually apply it to to business in my own way. And I did. It's a good story. And uh, first off, it's awesome you have a supportive partner, husband now, who saw saw that for you as well. And I'm sure it was nice to lean on during the decision-making process. You know, you decided to go all in. You've rose the ranks and you have the role that you're in today. If you hadn't done accounting, if you had a chance maybe at an early age to maybe try something else or dip your toes in another area that always was a little scary, but you never did, what do you think you would have done differently? So if you're asking me that question, um, I would probably have said like a lawyer because I I love arguing, (laughs) but uh, (laughs) Like critical, are you like critical thinking and feedback and all of that? I, I do love those types of conversations. I like to not always agree. I like when people don't always agree with me, and I like the stimulated conversations that come out of a problem solving. But if you ask anybody else, especially my employees, they will tell you I should have become a psychologist because that's what that's a, it's a big part of what I do as a CEO of this company, making sure that every single person is given individual attention, making sure that you're kind of aware of what's going on in the company morale and the culture. And if somebody has a problem, you treat it differently from somebody else's problem. Um, and then, you know, when you're working with the younger generation as well, it's, you know, everybody wants to make friends, but they also work together. And sometimes they just don't know how to separate the two. Um, and so you'll kind of have to always be um, mindful of their situation and their emotional state and and also how smart they are. And how do you combine all of those things to make sure that they're still on the right path and they don't make the wrong decisions in terms of where they work, what kind of function they're doing. They're also open to coming to me anytime with, hey, I kind of want to try out something in this department. Something looks really great. This is what I studied. And so I'm always having those career conversations with people. But, you know, a lot of people also approach me with their personal challenges and they ask me for advice. And and so I think it's a really big and important part of what I do and running a software company with a lot of employees. You have a more math logic mindset, perhaps culturally, you know, and then you know you love the argument back and forth and kind of getting to a side and a reason with logic. But when running a company, to your point, right, that there's an emotional side that you need to take into account to be there for your people, to motivate, inspire, to hold them accountable to things. Do you think that was a muscle that you had already built coming into Bonexa, or do you think that's an area of growth that you've really had to build? And if so, how have you been able to um, build that muscle and over time? Let me think. It's a, it's a great question. I think it might be a little bit of both. Um, I do think I, I do have the muscle uh, from when I was a child and I've always been a little bit more different uh, in the way that I approach myself emotionally and how I approach situations. Like for example, I've noticed early on when I'm 
about to be speaking to somebody, I might be really, really nervous. But as soon as I sit down, it's almost like I separate myself from my emotions and I can just go with the flow and have a great conversation and all of this. So I've noticed that pretty early on in my childhood, growing up in school and, and career. And I think that my muscle was there to be able to seg segment my emotional intelligence from my intelligence and be able to think of something more critically and more present rather than emotionally driven. Uh, and so I think I've had that, but I will tell you if, if I did have that, it has been developed really significantly with people that I worked with in the past. So I've found myself in situations where everybody's in a heightened emotional state and nobody's really looking at the actual problem and nobody's thinking of it from a, from a strategy perspective. And I'm not saying I am, but I do recognize that nobody is. And at some point I'm like, okay, I need to be much better at not only doing that for myself and making sure that I think presently, be there present, think of reality, and then emotions can just help support that. Uh, but in addition to me being good at that, how do I also influence other people to do that when we're in a big room? How do we not talk for one hour about who likes who when we actually have a problem we can solve by putting our brains together? In this company that I work at, one of the big lessons that I learned, which I would say everybody should learn is, you don't have to be liked by everybody. And if you're not, it shouldn't bother you. It shouldn't affect you. Uh, yes, if you're not a, a ideal person and you actually cause hardship to somebody, of course you should change. But if you're not doing anything to hurt somebody and they don't like you, that is okay. That is part of business. That is part of growth. And it's just going to happen. So every time you focus on it, you're just hindering yourself and that person too. And so I don't do that anymore. And I'm, I'm okay with people liking me and people not liking me as long as there's mutual respect in what we're doing. If we're all working on the same project, why does it matter how we feel about each other kind of a situation? Yeah, that's awesome. And, you know, I think what I heard you say was when a problem does arise, you're always looking around the corner saying, okay, how, what does this mean strategically? That becomes also easier to separate emotion from just because you're looking at it how this, what's happening here can impact the business six months, years down the road. You're right. Business is always going to be people who uh, you don't get along with, people who are not aligned with. And, but also there's a lot of growth in, in learning how to play nicely in that there's growth in that as well. So it's great that you're creating a culture that helps people know that that is okay. You talked about kind of coming into this role, maybe not having the, all the experience or the toolkit. Where do you think that you personally have been the most challenged or the most unequipped at times. Where else, when you kind of look at the last few years, do you say, wow, I've really had to make immense strides there or strong delegations there? So in my, in my short career as an accountant, there was a lesson there. And one of the lessons was, uh, you know, I didn't have enough experience, even as a licensed CPA uh, in a big four, that's not enough experience for a couple of years to be able to go into a startup and manage all levels of finances, right? So in a bigger company, you are you get really, really good at something really small, but you become an expert at it. In a small company, it's the exact opposite. You kind of have to be good enough at everything. You don't have to be an expert, but you have to know just enough to know what resources to pull in, what kinds of people to delegate some tasks to, and also how to manage a project. Those are all things that I was very new to. And so it was a really, really big learning curve. So that's where, uh, you know, you come in and you're supposed to run a finance department. You're supposed to create one and run it. But if you don't know, do you feel bad? for yourself or do you go and find resources that can help you do your job? And so that's one of the main things I did. I got, you know, third party auditing company to make sure that my job is handled properly and I'm not doing anything wrong. And I got a third party tax company to make sure that they're filing the taxes in ways that I can't. And eventually I was able to hire people that can monitor the third party companies and work together. And, and even though now I'm a lot better at it than I used to, I kept that strategy because I think separating finance uh, internally and externally is actually very important for the integrity of the business. And so it was a challenge in the beginning that I think well, I navigated through. And the, the bigger challenge, though, was I've never been in a software company before. I don't know what an API is. I don't know what 
uh, you know, what a user interface is compared to a backend. And, and so I had to learn all of those things. And during the transition phase from accounting into strategy and business in the tech company, I watch and learn a lot. So I think that me being involved, which I, I think my boss, who's the owner of the company, he involved me in every meeting, whether I had any knowledge about what the meeting was about, whether I knew who was going to be in the meeting, I was there. And so I was there to listen. I was there to take information, but I was also there to offer feedback from a very different perspective if the opportunity came. That was another challenge. Um, But I think that with my ability to really listen and not feel like I have to talk just because I'm in the room helped me uh, just settle my emotions down and be like, well, I'm here for a reason. And if I can't offer anything, I can at least learn. I asked questions and, and eventually I was able to grasp a lot more knowledge than I had to navigate through that. Yeah, it's a journey of becoming an operator, coming into a business and having no idea what's going on. It seems like your boss, you know, I was reading, I finished a book actually this summer called Unbound about Amazon and Jeff Bezos always had a technical advisor shadowing him. And almost you were that person for your boss. Was that was that boss the CEO of the company before you took over? Yes, he was owner and CEO, and he's still the owner and president, and I'm the CEO now, yes. What do you think he saw in you to say, you know, I have all these employees, you popped up, started doing a great job, he brought you into the fold, now you're CEO. Why Why do you think he made that decision in, in terms of what you brought to the table? Yeah, I'll have to ask him, but, but what I think is... Um, I'm, I'm very detail oriented and that's probably because of the finance background. You can't exactly afford to make a lot of mistakes. So I'm very detail oriented and I like to make sure that I understand a conversation while it's happening. So I'm always asking questions and I don't really care if my questions are uh, accepted or not. The fact is I don't know and I need to know. And so I won't waste your time if I can Google it, obviously, but I, I'm the type of person that I will not waste your time, but I will make sure that if I really don't know and you're the only one that can provide it to me, I make sure to ask my questions. I think that's that's a big factor. The second factor is um, I'm not a yes man. Uh, if I don't agree with something, I will say that I don't, and I don't ever think that my job's on the line for disagreeing. You can still do what you want to do, even if I disagree, but at least let's have a conversation. Let's see, maybe there was a point I missed or a point you missed, and therefore a better decision could be made out of it. So I think that helps with strategy. And so I've been able to be pulled in to meetings as hard as saving a really big client to as easy as having a conversation between two employees bickering. And so I've been able to uh, navigate through those situations in their own ways, very different circumstances. They were both successfully managed. And, and that, that could kind of tie everything that you're saying together, right? My ability to separate my own emotional state from a situation that has nothing to do with me. And yes, of course, you don't want to lose a revenue. But at the end of the day, if you don't do something about it, you're going to lose it anyway. So why stress over the fact that you might lose it when you can actually save it? So I think there's a few things that he saw in me. And uh, the last point will probably be I can, I'm can i comfortable talking to anybody, really. Um, I treat all people the same. I think that if you're a CEO of a really large company and you're well-known, you're still a person. And you should be treated like a person unless you don't treat me like one, then that's a different situation. But I don't think that anybody goes around not wanting to be treated like a person. And I am aware of that. So I don't have a problem talking to anybody. I don't have a problem interviewing a receptionist or talking to a CEO of a multi-billion dollar company. And so I think that that's probably a big factor in, in this decision as well. Yeah, just from this conversation, I mean, you're very diplomatic and kind of your approach to things and right when you can... Yes, you might have the emotional intelligence, but when you can balance it with a kind of decision making and a financial lens and also a people lens, right? It's a kind of rare, a rare skill set to understand how to piece it all together in a way that clearly makes the business run. What's next? How are you thinking about decisions for five years, three years down the road in terms of where you want to be? Um, uh, I've got a couple of answers for that. So initially, who doesn't want to make the next billion dollar company in the next three, four years, right? And so, of course, that's always the goal, maybe not in three, four years, but that's definitely always the goal. I, I'm more of the mindset of let's grow this company to be large enough where we have the luxury of decisions. Let's sell it off now and make some money and start something else, right? 
I want to see my project finished, right? I want to mm. I want to make sure that, you know, I'm mindful of everybody that's at stake here, which may, na- namely the owner of the company, right? And so, yes, I also have to make sure that he's in a comfortable state for a company that he started. Um, but at the end of the day, you've got two choices. You can either prematurely go out there and possibly sell the company, or you can try to grow this to an extent where you're going to have people knocking on your door, trying to buy this company. And you've now got the luxury of deciding what you want to do Um, Mm -hmm. because, you know, finance is not a problem and, and you've got thousands of mouths you're feeding and lots of families you're, you're helping and, and you even have some disposable income from the company to do charitable activities. Once you feel like you grew the company to where it actually needs to be, then that luxury is there. And that's where I want to get the company to in the next three to five years. I think it's a good goal, right? And I, part of what you said is really interesting. Yeah, you have Eleanor, who's the president now, put you in place. So you, you know, so we can sleep better at night because you're doing your job the right way. Do, do you ever think about that, though? Do you ever feel that pressure? Uh, hey, you know, I'm responsible for getting the business here so that, you know, certain outcomes can happen. You know, how, how do you handle that? It's it's tough, I'll tell you. I, I won't lie and say it's, it's a walk in the park. You know, competition is out there and, and it, it's a really complicated technology software um, and it caters to really large companies. And so there's a lot of pressure, yes, but at the end of the day, I feel lucky to be in a position where I know that I'm trusted to make decisions. And if I make the types of decisions that don't get the company to where it needs to be, it was it was based on hard work and some really hard thinking. And so it just might have been the wrong decision. And that's all it is. It's not because I was too lazy to do it. It's not because I didn't work hard enough. Um, it's really because it just wasn't a good decision and therefore this happened. And so I'm lucky that I have that type of a relationship with with both the owner of the company as well as all of the employees that I always have the best interest of the company and personnel in mind. You know, it, it's definitely a pressure. Like it, it's not yeah. it's not easy to have tough conversations, but when you do, going in there confidently knowing that you did everything in your power to make it right really feels good. Seems like he's very supportive though. Back, back on this thread line of growth, which has seemed to be a constant throughout this conversation, I heard a quote from our leadership coach uh, a few months ago, and it really stuck with me. And he said, a company can scale and grow only as as fast as the leader at the company or leadership at the company evolves on a personal level. For Bonexa to take the next steps, what what do you think that's going to require out of you and your team to, to be able to do that? I'd say knowing knowing what your skill sets are is really important, and I don't mean that in a smaller in a small scale at all. For example, everybody in the company has their job; everybody's got their task. Right? But but in order to have people treat the company as if it was their own and really love the product that they're selling or servicing or whatever their role is, uh, they have to have some flexibility to make decisions, right? And so when it comes to the sales team, what kinds of companies do they go after to feel really good about the company that they closed? Do they have the ability to give feedback to me, for example, about the types of companies they want to prospect? And then for me is, um, you know, what do I do on a daily basis? Sure, I monitor departments and sure, I talk to people, but I'm I'm probably one of the only ones in a position and strictly because of my title, not because I'm more intelligent by any means, but strictly because of my title, I can go and get those big brand names to become partners with us. I can get them to at least sit down with our sales team to be demoed a product. I know that my title gives me that opportunity and that that door to walk through. And then I can bring my team to be able to showcase this product. So I do think that in order to help continue grow um, as a company and culture, you have to give the people ability to do what they can without giving them so much that they'll break. Uh, and yeah. so, you know, I, I can, t- I can go tell a salesperson, go get me Google, for example. Right. Uh, and it's a, ch- it's a, it's a big challenge. Like it, it would be easier for me to do it because I've got the title and they'll probably, they'll probably pay attention. But if they can't do it, then now I've, I've kind of ruined their confidence. And now are they going to be able to go after smaller clients and, and feel good about what they're offering? It's a great conversation about creating a culture of ownership and trust, right? So they can go out not only about the process and experience, but they feel empowered to utilize their skills in the best way possible. It's going to drive the, the company where you know you ultimately need it to go. 
but obviously with more people. Can't never easy. Easier said than done. A large part of coming to work and showing up as your just full self and being the best leader possible is also uh, taking care of yourself and uh, doing the things for yourself outside of traditional what we call work today to, to be to do that. Well, what are some of the habits that as a CEO that you have found that have worked for you to stay healthy and, and continue to show up as a leader? Uh, this is actually pretty pretty new for me. So I, ha- I also have two kids. I have uh, little kids. They're four and six. Yeah. So about, you know, three to four years ago, I was in a place where, you know, I'm I'm married. I have my kids. I have this big position at the time. It was nowhere near CEO. But what am I doing to cater to myself and to take care of myself? You know, it's not easy to go back to your body after you have kids. It's not easy to go back to the same energy after you have them. And as much as kids are the best and they give you this this spark of energy, uh, there's only so much a person can handle, right? Physically and emotionally. I came to a point where I was like, okay, I'm I'm overweight. I don't feel good. Um, I don't feel confident and I just need to change things. So my first thing was, of course, go to the gym. <laughs> and so it started there and I got on the, I got on the treadmill and every day I got on that treadmill and then I got absolutely addicted to running. And so now I'm always running. I'm running like, I don't know, up to five miles a day. Uh, and if I don't do that one day, I feel like I did nothing. And then it goes back to what everybody else says, right? Do the hardest thing first in the morning. And so running is hard, but it also helps me clear my head and it keeps me in shape and it makes me really, really happy. And it's my time. They can run next to me, but they can't be in my head while I'm running. It's my time. So a few things happen there, right? So I know I'm doing something to stay healthy for my job, for myself, for my kids and my family. Um, I know that I'm giving myself time to myself, which I find a lot of value in. And I'm staying healthy and and, uh, and I'm staying in shape. And so when I come to work, I feel confident and I love uh, dressing up for work. I love when everybody else does. We have a pretty strict dress code policy, but everybody loves it. Uh, they're just so happy, you know, comparing their new blazers and their new shoes all the time. Uh, and so I think that me doing that for myself has really helped me be an example for other people. Um, everybody that runs over the weekend comes to me like, hey, how much did you run this weekend? So it also creates this uh, topic of conversation to stay healthy. And then we're doing some wellness programs with the company based on all of this to make sure that people take care of themselves. Yeah, you can stay fit or you know, feel good. But you're right. There is that catharsis that comes along with taking care of yourself or creating that space for yourself just to be and think the fact that you've uh, found that and are so consistent with it, it seems like uh, it's awesome. But I also get the, the days where I don't, or I feel off schedule. It's like, Oh, well, I'm not taking care of myself. So it's, it's almost good. You feel that because it's uh, it's a push to get back into the, the gym or stay healthy with the right habits. So good for you. Yeah. And pushing through that first five minutes of like, I'd rather sleep another 15 minutes and go run. Pushing through that really helps. I'm that weird person that goes to vacations and goes running at 5.30 a.m. Then I enjoy my vacation more. I drink less. I eat better. It just makes me take care of myself during my vacation, which most people I know don't, rightfully so. It's a vacation, but... Yeah, no, it's good to keep the the habits consistent. Yeah, you can cheat a little and have fun, but I totally get your point for sure. As I've been speaking with more women CEOs lately who are juggling families, who are juggling kids, a full-time job, however open you're willing to share for your, for the partnership you're in, how, what's the role dynamic between you uh, and your husband and how do you guys support each other as you're building and scaling a company? And I'm sure, you know, I don't know if he's working, but what's that like, right? In the family dynamic with you being clearly very ambitious and uh, raising a family at the same time. Yeah, it's it's an important question. Uh, I get asked that a lot. And, and if it wasn't for his support, I probably would not have been able just strictly time wise and physical capacity wise do this. And so when we met way before, you know, we met in college. And so we both had nothing. And, and so his career took off a little bit faster than mine did because I had a little more school to go through. You know, he supported me during the entire process of me finding my career and going through the no, notions and motions. You know, when it came down to me finally figuring out what I want to do and grow, uh, the conversation was always, of course, I want to have children, but of course, I also want to keep my career and the type of career that I'm looking to have 
require some travel, they require some long hours of work. And we had that conversation early on. And thankfully, it's been a really consistent conversation. And it's it's become a little bit harder uh, as kids grow up and every, everyone's trying to spend time with their kids and myself included. And so now I structure my travel in a way where I get a good balance in place. So I make sure that when I go home, my phone is on the side. I can dedicate a couple hours to my kids and make sure that we have quality time when they go to sleep. And if I still have work, I can always get back on it. Um, but I'm mindful of that time that I'm spending with my family and his support has consistently stayed to make sure I can do that. Uh, I'm not married or have kids yet, but uh, it's, uh, it's glad that you're putting those boundaries in place. So you, you can't protect that time at home. One thing my mom who also worked while I was growing up, you know, she was always so good about looking back in retrospect, making time for us, you know, making time to carpool, do the things, right? Where we never really realized she was working, even though she was at 10 o'clock at night when we were in bed. So, uh, yeah. you know, it seems like you've learned to prioritize and it's awesome you have a supportive partner uh, through that process. Are there, any, are there any other holes that I wouldn't know to ask around or kind of lean into uh, that you would, you think are, would be worth addressing? Um, yeah, there, there's one topic I, I love talking about, um, and it revolves around the school system. And, and at what point do you have these types of conversations with children or young adults that are in school, right? So the stigma and the conversation nowadays is, you know, you pick a field to study so you can do that mm -hmm. forever. And so I'm here to say that that's not true. In my, in my case, in a lot of cases, and in fact, the more was executive level people that I meet, the less education seems like the most important factor. I'm not saying it's not because some people need that structure. They need that education. You can't become a doctor without it. So there are certain fields that it absolutely is necessary. When it comes to business, though, I think no matter what you've studied, um, you can definitely make a change uh, in your career and you shouldn't be scared to do that. And I speak a lot in universities about this as well. I've gone and I've interviewed PhD students that are creating this beautiful product and they're doing it as a school project and they have no goals as to what they want to do with it down the road because mm -hmm. they're not experienced with speaking to people. They don't know anything about investment. They don't know anything about financial health. And these are topics that for some reason we're avoiding during school. You know, those types of topics need to be discussed way early on, I think, before you become 10, before you become a teenager. So that way you can learn to communicate, especially in this day and age with, you know, with all of the electronics, like virtual reality. Like we don't even know our own reality. Now we're dabbling into virtual reality, uh, which is all great and it's forward thinking and it's innovative, but I don't want students to lose sight in, in that face-to-face -face communication and, and the financial knowledge. And it's not always somebody else handling your finances. Take the person that's doing it for you now for today. Let's just say your parents. God forbid, what happens if they, they can't support you that way anymore? What are you going to do? Are you going to sit down and lose everything that they've created for you? Or are you going to really get in there and figure it out? Because you have a little bit of knowledge and everything to, to pull it together. I think that's an important topic to discuss. Addressing that is systemic, right? So what, what needs to change, in your opinion, for proper education, for people to be equipped with a tool belt so they can go out and be dangerous in different areas of life beyond just what they're taught in their PhD program? It's gradual, right? So I think it, one of the, the best things that I did while I was in the big four, and, and I thank the company for it, but they would send us out to um, underserved cities, communities, to give financial health uh, classes to students. And these students were eight, nine years old, and they're just sitting there, they're barely learning their, their you know, second stage math or third stage math. And, and they're trying to learn about finances and what does it mean? So you don't go in there and say, hey, here's how you file your taxes, but you go in there and explain to them why money's important uh, important in terms of to buy you things and to make sure that you have a secure future, but not important enough to, you know, let go of your friends and compare your friends based on money and things like that. So gradually having those conversations to the point where once you really understand what money means, what finances mean, then that's when I think this is where schools suffer a lot, bringing in professionals. Teachers are great. They're educators, right? But they are teachers. And so if you want to teach somebody how to run a business, unless you have the business background and you can you can teach them that, you need to bring in resources. Everybody 
uh, resonates with a person differently, right? So you can bring in one guest speaker, three people might be into the conversation, but if you bring in another one, 20 people might be. Let, let the students have different styles of communication with people that they're trying to look up to so they can pick and choose what information they want to grasp. Guest speaking was one of the most boring things that we did in school. You know, I already listened to the teacher say the same thing, you know, it's, but bring me somebody different that's going to give me a different perspective, expose a student to something like that because they're only exposed at home, maybe a job that's just paying for their food and gas, uh, and then at school. What else can you bring to the table that, that they can see there's so many different types of people out there that you can learn from or stay away from. But yeah, like it's, it's, it's not happening now. It's really not. It's so sad to see people dedicate years and years and years into their knowledge and not be able to apply it in any way, shape or form later. I went to school at the university of Georgia and I, I had a few friends, you know, they were so rigid on, on getting great grades and the perfect classes to your point. And then, you know, what can I just acquire knowledge you know, I always joked with them, you know, it's not about what you know, but I said, it's about who you know. And not not just so much who you know, but it's like what you what you do with what you know and like the people you build around it. And I, I think there's part of the conversation too is understanding how to build like relationships in specific areas where maybe you don't have a certain skill sets because I think it's uncomfortable to go to people and say, I don't know how to do these things and ask for mm-hmm. help just because mm-hmm. by the structure, both men and women. I think you're absolutely right is how do we think about equipping people at a younger age with just life life survival skills. Yeah, and, and I know a lot of, so a lot of parents differ in this, right? Some, some parents want to give their kids a little bit of a hard life, not to the point where they're suffering, but hard enough where they can learn the value of life and, and what they have, right? So do you buy them five toys or do you buy them one and let them wear it out until they buy their second one? So, so those things differ, right? But there is the sense of entitlement nowadays with, with students and it's, it's not a bad thing. It's a, it's a confidence boost, which is great, but the reality is different, right? So you can't walk into your first job with a sense of entitlement because you should be thankful you have that job. And how do you make sure that the company knows you're thankful? What are you doing in exchange uh, to make sure that you grow in that company or you grow in that skill set to do something else? So that sense of entitlement, and I didn't grow up here in America. So I, I actually grew up in a in Armenia, which is a really hard life to have, especially back when I was there. So, so I've seen that. I've seen people struggle. I've seen uh, families that are very poor. I've seen like when the water runs out and lights don't go on. You know, it's hard to have a sense of entitlement when you when you've seen that. But I also don't can't blame people that have never seen it, and I hope they don't. Uh, but I do hope that they expose their mind to learn about the world in ways where it's not America and the American dream. Like people do have a hard life. That's kind of where some really great people are born when they see the life that other people are having and they're actually trying to do something to help. There's so many people that have never lived a hard life, but they're spending so much community service hours out there in the world helping people that have. You don't have to be in a situation to understand it, but you also shouldn't be fully shielded from that as a as a teenager and a young adult. Yeah, thank, and thanks for sharing the perspective of kind of what you saw growing up. You were talking about, you know, some parents maybe make, their lives for their kids a little more privileged or easier, but then you don't want to do it too much. What are you doing uh, with your partner or husband and how you're raising your kids so they can grow up and survive on their own in this world? A few things. One of them is rewarding for their good behavior, right? When they, when my son does something for my daughter or my daughter something, does something for my son or the kids do something for us. For example, yesterday, um, they made a mess of their playroom. I was like, you know, I'm really sad. I'm sad that you guys made a mess because I worked so hard and I earned the money to buy you these toys, but you don't really care. I want to make sure that you do value what I'm buying you. And obviously in, in more childish terms, they, they don't want to see that I work hard. They don't, they don't think of that perspective, right? So you have to tell them the perspective. Mom doesn't leave the house in the morning because she's trying to get away from you. She's leaving the house so she could go earn money to take care of you. Now they understand that slowly, you know, as they grow up, they'll understand it more and I'll have even more conversations with them. But after having that conversation, 10 minutes later, they wanted to surprise me how clean their room is because they went and they cleaned in their own little way, the entire room. When we walk into a toy store, for example, we buy 
one toy per person. It doesn't matter what the price is because they don't understand price at that age. It's and you know nothing there is that expensive. So it's I don't care how big or small it is. You get one toy, and if you break it, you don't get another one until you've worn out both. And we go another time, maybe a month from now. And so now we don't walk in screaming that I want two or three or my friend has this. It doesn't matter. They came in there with a mission. They just get to pick one. They can either collaborate about it or they can do it individually. Little things, very little. Eventually, those things will become more. Like when they turn 16, are they going to get a brand new car or an old car? I don't know yet. I haven't decided. It depends on. <laughs> <laughs> or they might not get a car. They take the bus. We'll see where, where we're at. It. <laughs> well, I, seem to, I, I love your perspective. It, it, it seems to be very, you know, how you parent. It's probably there's a lot of overlap with how you run and lead within the business. There's always gray and, you know, like businesses, like humans are growing and evolving organisms. And, you know, there's, there's never one way to, to do things. Toddlers or if they're adults, the human nature is the same. For example, let's apply that to work. You can stock up the kitchen. Um, you can have five different types of milk, but somebody decides they want, you know, low fat, soy, almond milk, whatever it is. Right. And, and so it's always going to be there and it's not a bad thing. So people really do want what they want. If you teach them that way from while they're young and there's no right way of teaching, I think every parent should decide what makes sense for their family. If you teach them the way that you want them to become adults and appreciate even the little things, even if they have money, I think that because human nature is the same, I think that that lesson will stick you know, provided that outside influences and stuff aren't there, which they always are, but you have to do your best. Kind of like me as a CEO and me as a parent, I just have to do my best. Like I can't, I can't protect them from everything and I can't give them all of the lessons, but at least I can do what I can do. What, what's maybe the impact that you hope that you've, you've left on people? How do you, how would you define that or share that? I, I'd say, I hope I'm a good example to people in my own way, right? I I hope they can look at me and at least one person can say, you know, if she was able to make, let's say this career change, maybe I can too. Or, you know, that conversation that we had that one day really boosted my confidence. And therefore now I do this and this and this. I, I, it's, it's the little things. I care more about that than anything else. Like I do, do they want to say, you know, because of her, I worked in a really successful company. Sure. They might, but that's not a personal impact, right? That's more of a, the company grew and it's a noticeable company and it has a good brand and therefore I'm a part of it, which is all great. But I think the little things matter more. It's, Hey, that one conversation or that one outing that we did or, or the five minutes that we spent in the balcony smoking hookah, which we do, um, you know, and I don't care what position you're in. If you want to smoke hookah with me, we can sit and have a conversation, a five minute hookah session. Um, those things make a difference. And I, I see people change that way. And I'm also one of those people, like if people, if employees, which happens all the time, obviously, if they think their time here is done, um, I always support them through the rest. You know, if they, if they have this one company, they've always tried to work at in, in the past and they finally got the opportunity, I will give my blessing. I, I want them to succeed. And I just want them to take something that they learned here over there and be even more successful. So I look at a person as a whole and not just as an employee, because, you know, it's not everybody's going to be the same type of employee that I want. So I have to respect them as people as well. Set an example. I think that's a great way to end. Um, thank you for, thank you for sharing, uh, and just took such a raw journey and, uh, it seems like your childhood was super formative as well and it just constantly pushed you in all areas of your life and I should be proud of what you're building. So thank you. Where uh, where can people find you, reach out to you, get to know you uh, if they listen? Um, I'm Google's an easy one, Lilith Daftian, um, D A V T Y A N, or you know, I've got my LinkedIn. Um, I'm not all that active in other social media, but I'm pretty active in LinkedIn and um, I obviously have uh, my emails, so you can get that through LinkedIn as well, definitely. Thank you for joining me on The One Away Show. If you enjoyed this episode as much as I did, please leave a review and follow us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Have a One Away moment you'd like to share? Follow me on Twitter or Instagram at Brian Wish underscore, or reach out to me on LinkedIn and tell me about the moment that altered your life. 
The One Away Show is produced by ArcBound, a company dedicated to helping entrepreneurs, experts, and visionaries launch authentic personal brands. From message development to podcast production, social media content generation, and book writing, we work with you to create your arc. Head to arcbound.com to learn more. Thank you for listening, and please join me next time on The One Away Show.